Well, good morning and happy Easter. This is an awesome day. Our Lord is risen. I want to invite you to turn with me to Acts chapter 17 in your Bibles. Acts 17. We live in a culture of confusion. On March 24th, 2022, Ketanji Brown Jackson was questioned by Senator Marsha Blackburn from Tennessee at her confirmation hearing in preparation for her to be on the United States Supreme Court. Blackburn, the senator, asked her, can you provide a definition for the word woman? Jackson replied, quote, can I provide a definition? No, I can't. I am not a biologist. We live in a culture that is very confused over many things. We are confused sexually where men want to be women and women want to be men and children even are now being confused about their sexual identity. In addition to sexual confusion, we also see moral confusion. In December of 2023, the president of Harvard was questioned in Congress about the Palestinian protesters on her campus and she could not get herself to say that it was wrong for the Palestinian protesters to demand genocide for the Jewish people. She said, it depends on the context. To which the congresswoman replied, in which context would it be okay to demand for the genocide of an entire nation? There's moral confusion in our culture. There's logical confusion as well, too, just flat-out inability to be logical. I saw a picture the other day of a robotic hand, and it was extremely intricate. And underneath that was the words, intelligent design. And then next to it was a picture of a human hand, inside the human hand. It was even more intricate, and underneath it, it said, random chance. We live in a culture that is logically confused and, of course, a culture that is also spiritually confused. We live in a culture where people believe nothing about God or they believe anything and everything about God. My friend sent me an article this past week about the rise of atheist churches. You heard me. Atheist churches, and in the article it said there has been a recent rise in secular congregations that explicitly mimic religious organizations and their rituals to celebrate atheistic worldviews. One such church is called the Sunday Assembly, and it has been dubbed the first atheist megachurch. We live in a culture that is spiritually confused All of this led liberal writer Kurt Anderson to write an article in The Atlantic in September of 2017, and the title of the article was, How America Lost Its Mind. And he says this, quote, if the 60s amounted to a national nervous breakdown, and it did, we are probably mistaken to consider ourselves over it. In other words, even the world concede that we are losing our collective mind. Ironically, later in the article, he contributes to that national confusion by saying this, quote, but being American means we can believe anything that we want, end quote. So we live in a culture that is sexually confused, morally confused, logically confused, spiritually confused, and we pride ourselves in our diversity of ideologies. But in the midst of that pride looms a giant question over our souls that haunts our souls. What is the actual truth? What is the actual truth about life and death, 
about right and wrong, about God and man, about eternity. Why are we here? What is our purpose? Where did we come from? And most importantly, where are we going? And why do we have to die? Why do we have to die? Why can't we keep on living? Why do we have to die? Nothing's changed. Nothing is new under the sun because the same questions that we ask today were asked 2,000 years ago in ancient Athens, the city that the Apostle Paul walks into here in Acts chapter 17 on his second missionary journey. The Athenian culture was a culture of confusion. They had one of the greatest cities in the known world. They had architectural advancements, technological advancements. They were known for their literature and their art and their poetry. And they most especially were known to be the world leaders in philosophy and ideologies. It was the home of Aristotle, Plato, and Socrates. And like America, it was a melting pot of diverse opinions, values, philosophies, ideas, convictions. But it wasn't just diverse intellectually and philosophically, it was also diverse spiritually. They believed in polytheism, which is the belief in many gods. They were pluralistic in that there was no one authority that you could appeal to. They were syncretistic in blending a lot of their different beliefs about the gods. They were pantheistic in believing that God was in everything instead of, instead of the biblical worldview where he stands outside of creation. And as Paul toured this city, waiting for his friends to come, he saw what one commentator said was a city drowning in idolatry drowning in idolatry and seeing this and being jealous for God's glory and God's name, he became deeply disturbed, deeply upset. Look at verse 16 in your Bibles. Verse 16. Now while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, his spirit was provoked, or as the NIV puts it, quote, greatly distressed within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. Idolatry, of course, is when a human being, whether they lived 2,000 years ago or today, worships, ready for this, creation instead of the creator. That's idolatry. When a person worships what has been made rather than the one who made it. That's idolatry, and Romans 125 says that we, human beings, exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the, cre the creature rather than the creator. Romans 125, the single greatest condemned sin in all of the Bible is idolatry because it is the replacement of God. So how do I know if I'm an idolater? Well, if you want to know if you are an idolater, like these ancient Athenians, just think of the word worship. And when you think of the word worship, think of the word sacrifice. When we worship someone or something, we will always, catch this, we will always sacrifice to it. We make sacrifices to whatever we worship. So what do we worship? We worship false gods. We worship, listen to this, what we think will save us out of our misery and bring us into happiness. It's as simple as that. We worship whatever we think will save us out of our misery and bring us into happiness. And whatever you think that is, you will make sacrifices in your life to get it. You will sacrifice time, money, money, energy, possessions, your reputation, children, family. You'll, you'll sacrifice anything, whatever it takes to be saved out of your misery and brought into a state of happiness. This is why you have some fathers who abandon their families to go be with their secretary. They're willing to sacrifice their family, their children. They're willing to sacrifice their own reputation 
to be in a state of happiness. That's idolatry. Or people who live for the praise of men. They want other people to look upon them in awe. They live for the praise of men. That's their idol. They will sacrifice their conscience, the integrity of their soul, to lie about how good they are. So they'll sacrifice their soul, their conscience, in order to get the praise of men, lying about how good they are. They'll sacrifice their time and their money to look good for their clothing, their style, exercise, everything. If they think that the praise of men will bring them out of their misery into a state of happiness, they will sacrifice almost anything to get it. Or food. People will sacrifice reputation. They'll sacrifice the praise of men in order to have food, to eat lots of food, which is why Paul says in Philippians 3.19, their God is their stomach. They will sacrifice reputation and the praise of men to be brought out of their state of misery and into a state of happiness. Or some people worship money. And they'll sacrifice their family. They'll sacrifice their wife, their children, working long hours. You see, we are no different than the Athenians. We too are a culture drowning in idolatry. And when we encounter that idolatry in the culture or in our own lives, we ought to be, verse 16, deeply distressed. And Paul was just that. But Paul was not the type to allow his anger and distress at the, at the idolatry in his culture to cause him to lash out at his culture Instead, he channeled that passion, he channeled that anger, he channeled that, that provoked spirit that he had at the idolatry, he channeled it into the preaching of the gospel. Look at verse 17. So, you see the connection there? He saw the, idea, the idolatry. So, therefore, he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Now, whenever we proclaim the gospel as Christians, as Paul is doing here, we're going to get a variety of reactions from people. One of those reactions is condescension. Condescension, look at verse 18. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him, and some said, what does this babbler wish to say? The word babbler literally means seed picker. It really described birds that hung around the marketplace and picked at seeds. And it became a word for people who scavenged around the marketplace going from person to person. And they said, who is this person, Paul, going around from person to person in the marketplace? You know, because he was evangelizing people. Who is this seed picker? Who is this babbler? It was a derogatory term for an unsophisticated, uneducated person in that culture. And I suppose it is not lost on me that there are people who come here to this church and they hear me and they say, who is this babbler? Going on and on about circumcision and the outer man and the inner man and how they are fighting each other. And he seems to think that he was crucified with Christ 2,000 years ago. Who is this babbler who is speaking for over 50 minutes. Jesus' family in Mark, Gospel of Mark, said he was out of his mind. He's out of his mind. And listen to what Festus, the governor, said about Paul. And with a loud voice, Acts 26, 24, with a loud voice, Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you out of your mind. People are going to look upon us with condescension. Secondly, they're going to look upon us with confusion. Look at verse 18, the middle of verse 18. Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. Now notice the word divinities, plural, Plural, because they thought that Paul was preaching about Jesus, the male God, and the resurrection. In the Greek, in the Greek resurrection is Anastasis, and it sounds very uh, familiar to a Greek goddess named Anastasia. And so they thought that he was preaching 
a plurality of gods. Jesus, the male god, and Anastasis, the uh, female god. And I can imagine many times Paul, when he was teaching, said, no, 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 that, that's not what I meant. And it's the same with us. When people look at us and they say, oh, so you're, you're an evangelical Christian. And you say, uh, well, yes. And they say, so you believe that Donald Trump is God's prophet to America? Uh, uh, no, no, that's not, and you believe women want to be subjugated, subjugate, uh, no, let's, let me, you know, and do you speak in tongues? I think you guys speak in tongues. You're like, well, some Christians believe in, and, you know, actually it's the reversal of Babel, it, never mind. <laughs> you just confuse them. We're confusing to many in the culture, or some people react with concern, concern. And by concern, I do not mean pity. I mean they're disturbed by what we have to say. They're uncomfortable with what we have to say. Look at verse 19. Verse 19 says, and they what? And they took him and they brought him to the Areopagus. Notice that it says that they took him. Now, this doesn't mean that they were necessarily hostile towards him. Many were interested in what he had to say, but some commentators believe that the Areopagus, it was a people, not a place. It was a council, it was a group that would sort of police, police all the ideas and philosophies coming in and out of Athens. And so they would take people and bring them to the Areopagus. They were tolerant, they were open-minded to many different beliefs, but there was a line. They were still concerned, they were still uncomfortable with what Paul had to say. The same thing is true today. Our culture is very tolerant, very open-minded. They want to hear all types of truth so long as you don't cross the line. And if you cross the line, then they go from being open-minded to being very uncomfortable and concerned with what you have to say. I still remember when John MacArthur was on Larry King and he was talking about homosexuality and about how it was sinful. And the then uh, governor, now governor, Gavin Newsom of California stopped the whole thing. He said, listen, I'm growing uncomfortable with this language. Our culture is concerned, disturbed. But a fourth reaction that they have is curiosity. Curiosity. Look at verse 19. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting for you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Remember King Herod? How King Herod was fascinated by the preaching of John the Baptist. Now, why was King Herod fascinated by the preaching of John the Baptist? John the Baptist said that King Herod's marriage was unlawful. So why would he be fascinated by his preaching and want to hear John the Baptist preach every time? It's because even if you don't accept the messenger of Christianity, the messenger of the gospel, even if you disagree, there's still something in the deepest part of your soul that resonates with what's being said. Because the person is talking about the very issues that you think about. Life and death, God, eternity, salvation. It's hitting a spiritual nerve. Everyone deep down inside knows that there is a judgment coming. Everyone wants eternal life. And these are the things that Christianity talks about, that there is going to be a coming judgment, and there is such a thing as eternal life, and there is such a thing as a God. But whether a person believes it or not, there's one thing that we know for sure. They do know, the culture does know, the world does know that what they believe isn't cutting it. It's not working because they're still empty, they're still hopeless, and they're still wrestling with their guilt. Do you hear that? Believe it or not, they do deep down inside know that it resonates in their soul. And you know that because of the dissatisfaction that they have that drives them to constantly entertain and want to hear new ideas. 
If they were satisfied with their worldview, if they were satisfied with their beliefs, their personal doctrine, if they truly were content in that and truly believed that it was true, they would have no need for new ideas. They'd be like, I have the truth. But as we can see, look at verse 21. They would spend all their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. Why are people always entertaining new philosophies and perspectives? Because they're not content deep in their soul with what they actually say that they believe. So knowing this, Paul now speaks boldly. And he has a bit of an introduction before he gets into his main message. Look at the introduction, verse 22. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens... I perceive that in every way you are, what's he call them? Very religious. Don't misunderstand what Paul is doing here. He's not flattering them in order to gain favor. He is disarming them. Or you could say he's not being complimentary, but he is being conciliatory. Being complimentary is about flattery. Being conciliatory is about civility. So Paul is building a bridge. He's being conciliatory by saying that they're very religious. It would be like me, uh, you know, out evangelizing Ed Dannemiller. You know, Ed Dannemiller's with me, and Ed asked me to go evangelize that guy over there. And I'm like, okay. And I walk over to the guy, and I see that he's wearing a very big, obnoxious Pittsburgh Steelers winter coat. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I say, I, I can see that you're passionate about football. I'm being conciliatory, hopefully a little bit civil towards the person. That's all that Paul is doing here. Verse 23, look with me. For I passed along and observed the objects of your worship. I found also an altar with this inscription. Catch this. To the unknown God. To the unknown God. These inscriptions and altars were very common in the ancient Near East. We have a lot of literature that attests to the fact that many cultures had an altar to an unknown God. This was judgment insurance. This was just in case we look, look, overlooked some deity out there in Godland. We're going to construct this altar to cover all of our bases. And once again, modern man is not that different from the ancient Athenians. 1,600 years after this moment, philosopher Blaise Pascal developed an argument known as Pascal's Wager. You know what Pascal's Wager is? It basically is this. You better live a life acknowledging God. Because if there's no God, and it turns out to be there's no God, then you've really lost nothing. But if there is a God... Well, then you've gained eternity. That was Pascal's wager, philosopher Blaise Pascal. British philosopher and writer Ian King wrote an article. He's a well-known philosopher, writer. Wrote an article or a book, excuse me, called How to Make Good Decisions and Be Right All the Time. He was a humble man. <laughs> and this is what he said in the article. What does it hurt to pursue value and virtue? If there is value, then we have everything to gain. But if there is no value or no virtue, then we haven't lost anything, right? What are we doing? We're covering our bases. This is judgment insurance. The story is told of a boy who goes up to his grandpa. They're at uh, an Easter service. And he says, Grandpa, you never go to church. Why are you here today? And the grandpa said, just in case. It's judgment insurance. And now that Paul has gotten through his introduction, he gets to his main message. And what is his main message? It is this. Your view of God, your view of God is ignorant. It's ignorant. He says down in verse 30 that their view of God is ignorant. This was not, listen, this was not a put down he wasn't trying to put them down, where in verse 30 later he calls them ignorant. He was describing their plight. 
They didn't have the knowledge that they needed about God in order to be saved. And so he goes on to systematically dismantle and deconstruct their view of God. And the first thing that he says about God is that God is not many. God is one. God is one. If you look at the very beginning of verse 24, what are the first two words that you see there? The God. The God. Not the gods, but the God. Most people back then were polytheistic. And then he says that God is creator. That's the second thing. God is creator. He goes on in verse 24. The God who made, who made the world and everything in it. You know, most people throughout history believed that the world was eternal, uncreated. Aristotle, in his book Physics, advocated for this view that the world is eternal, having no beginning. The world has always been here. Most people throughout history have believed this. Most people throughout history have not been evolutionists. They believe that the world is eternal and it's always been there because that is man always trying to explain away a creator. It is much more convenient to think that the world is just eternal rather than the fact that the world has been created because if the world has been created, then there is a creator. Mankind will believe anything that removes God from the equation. The third thing that he says about God is that God is Lord. Lord, the God who made the world and everything in it. And then what's he say? Being Lord of heaven and earth. Now this is the part that really could have gotten Paul in trouble. Because in his day, this was a treasonous statement. In 44 AD, the imperial cult was started, which demanded that everyone pay homage to Caesar as Lord and a divine person. Well, Paul, here in Acts, this is probably around 50 AD, so this thing is really heating up. So for him to to say this would have been extremely scandalous. And we actually have a letter from a Roman governor back then. It's called Pliny's Letter to Trajan. And in that letter, Pliny, this Roman governor, he describes how he tortured and killed Christians for not offering incense to Caesar and and calling him Lord. And so Paul comes along and calls Jesus Lord. You know, men, men, men hate Men hate that because they hate authority. We hate authority in the government. We hate authority in the workplace. We hate authority in the home. We hate authority anywhere we go. And so to call someone Lord goes against our very rebellious DNA, doesn't it? But Paul says this is who God is. He is your creator, who loves you, but he is also your Lord. Paul goes on to say, number four, that God is omnipresent. He's omnipresent, meaning he lives everywhere. He is everywhere. Look at what he says. Being Lord of heaven and earth, he does not live in temples made by man. This is what Solomon also said in 1 Kings 8.27. Behold, the highest heaven cannot contain you. How much less this house. And he was talking about the temple that was just built. You don't fit inside this temple, O God, is what Solomon said. Now God commanded that the temple be built so that it would be a reminder of his presence with them. But he did not command that a temple be built so that they would think that they could contain God within this localized area. God can't be contained within a localized area. But, boy, that thought is really appealing to man, isn't it? Because if God can be contained over there, well, then he can't see what I'm doing over here. You see, we don't want to think that God can see everything 
But as Hebrews chapter 4 verse 13 says, no creature, do you hear that? No creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. God is omnipresent. He's everywhere. He sees everything. Fifthly, God is self-sufficient. Self-sufficient. He doesn't need anyone or anything. Look at verse 25. Nor, he goes on to say, is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. In the ancient world, the Greco-Roman world, this is how they related to the gods. They related to the gods in kind of the same way that you and I relate to our bosses at work. Our bosses, well, they, they need us, especially if our services are in demand and especially if we're good at what we do. Our bosses need us, but we also need our bosses so that we can have an income. And so that's how we kind of relate to one another. And that's how the ancient Romans and Greeks related to the gods. They kept playing games of manipulation and control so that we both can get what we want out of this deal. And Paul says, hey, that's not how it is with God. God did not create you and I because he was bored. He didn't create people because he was lonely. God is not in need of anyone or anything. He is completely self-satisfied within himself, within the Godhead, within the Trinity. He created us. Why? To give us himself. To give us himself. That we would know the joy of the Almighty God and his glory and his love. He did not create us so that we could provide his needs and give to him. He created us so that we could give him glory, honor, and love. Sixthly, God is sustainer. Sustainer. Look at verse 25, middle of verse 25. Since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. Now, do you see that word give, gives? That's in the present active tense, which means it's a continuous action, which means that Paul is saying God is continually giving everyone in this room everything that they need to live. He is continually providing for you food, water, housing, God is continually, listen, providing for you your breath. The reason that each one of us woke up this morning is because God gave us breath. He is continually providing breath for you. This is what Daniel said to a wicked king back in Daniel chapter 5, verse 23. He said this to the wicked king, but you have lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven. King, You are angry at God. You are proud. And you have praised the gods of silver and gold, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. King, you're an idolater. Which do not see or hear or know. But now listen to this. The God in whose hand is your very breath, you have not honored. God is your sustainer. He is self-sufficient. He's creator, Lord. He's everywhere. This is the correct view of God. Seventh, God is sovereign. He has the right to determine to do whatever he wants to do whenever he wants to do it because he is sovereign. Look at verse 26. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Do you know how we got the word university? The word university is a combination of two words, unity and diversity. Unity and diversity. 
To the ancient philosophers like Plato and Socrates, this was the whole goal of the pursuit of knowledge. This was the whole goal of the pursuit of education. It was to try to discover what is the unifying principle that governs and makes sense of all of these pieces and parts, the diversity that we see in this world. That is what the philosophers worked so hard to understand. And Paul here is addressing that, and he's saying, if you want to understand what that unity is, that all unifying principle that makes sense out of the diversity that you see in this life, it is God. God is the one who put you here, and he put you all over this globe. And why did God spread you all over the globe? Because he wanted you to seek him. And listen to this. Listen carefully. When you seek God, you honor him. Imagine if we're at a large festival, and I come up to you, and I say to you, I've been looking for you for like an hour. I heard that you were here. Someone told me that you were here. I've been looking for you for over an hour. I'm so glad that I found you. What would I be doing? I'd be bringing you honor, wouldn't I? I would be saying to you, I value you. This is why God commanded us to seek him so that the whole world would bring glory to him all over the globe. Now, someone might say, well, that sounds a little bit selfish of God, that he wants all this glory for everyone to give him glory. And my response to that is that God cannot give you anything greater than himself. Therefore, he has to point everyone to himself. It would be unloving for God to not glorify himself because in glorifying himself, he's pointing to himself here. Here's life. Here's love. Here's everything your soul wants. That's why the Bible says that God is to be glorified. It's not because he is a selfish, proud megalomaniac. It's because he knows that you can't be happy apart from him. Finally, all these are very similar for the eighth one. God is knowable, accessible, and imminent, meaning he's close. He's close to you. He's knowable. You can know him. It is possible for you to know God and the truth about God. He is accessible to you, and he is close to you. Look at verse 27, in the middle of verse 27. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. Do you see that? He is actually not far from each one of us. Verse 28, 4, and then he quotes one of their poets, in him we live and move and have our being. That was a quote from Epimenides, and Epimenides was basically admitting that God is close. He's close to all of us. And don't you find it interesting that in literature and the poetry and the art and the entertainment, Mankind, listen to this, in his poetry, literature, art, and entertainment is admitting things that are true about God that are contrary to what they actually believe. Mankind says, oh, you know, God isn't close. He's off, he's distant, he's not accessible. But here in their poetry, Epimenides, who's not a Christian, who worshiped Zeus, said that in him, We live and move and have our being. We are close to him. So out loud, you might be saying that God is not knowable, accessible, and close. But deep down, you know that's not true. You think about today. Out loud, we might say, I can save myself. I can be a good enough person to access eternal life. We as a world can come together and come up with a plan to save this world. This is how we think, and this is what we say that we believe. If that's true, then why the proliferation of all these superhero movies? Where we basically admit we need a savior. 
We need, listen, someone like us, but with supernatural ability. This is the man, Jesus Christ. A man, God in flesh like us, but with supernatural ability to save us. Another Greek poet is quoted in verse 28. For we are indeed his offspring. In other words, we come from God. Their own poets were admitting that we come from God. We are his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. And so I would ask any of you here, why are you so obsessed with your pet? Why are you obsessed with a particular animal? Why are you obsessed with music and sports? Why are you obsessed with food and drink and drugs? Why are you upset with nature and, and, and the ocean and the sun? Those things are inanimate objects. If we are God's offsprings, then that means If we are his children, and we are his offspring, and we're made in his image, what does that mean about God? It means he's a person. He's not an inanimate object that that we are worshiping, that we are dedicating our lives to, like money, food, sex, sports, animals, nature. Why do we worship these things? Why do we worship the creation instead of the creator? And so Paul has a conclusion to all of this, and the conclusion to his sermon is a call to repent, to repent. And God has been very patient with all of mankind. Look at what Paul says in verse 30. The times of ignorance God has overlooked. In other words, he's been very patient with your false views of him and your idolatry. But now... He commands all people everywhere to repent. And what does repent mean? It means to change your beliefs. That's what the word literally means, to change your mind, to change your thinking, to change your worldview, to change the convictions that you have about God, that he's distant, that he's uncaring, that he's removed himself, that he's unfair, that God is unknowable, that God doesn't exist. These are convictions and beliefs that God is saying you must let go of. You must repent of them. You must change them. You say, and if I don't? (laughs) Because I would really like to keep believing that he doesn't exist. And I would really like to keep believing that he's been unfair because then that excuses me for my unrighteousness. I want to hold on to these beliefs, and you're telling me to change them. What's going to happen to me if I don't? Well, look at verse 31. Because, here's the reason. He has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he is appointed. Who's he talking about there? Jesus. Do you know that Jesus in John chapter five in multiple places claimed to be the judge of the entire world? (laughs) Now listen, friends. (laughs) Either that's not true and he's insane and lying to us by which we could all go home now. Or it's true. Which one is it? Paul says, God has fixed a day in which he's going to judge the world. How about those words fixed? The day is already set. It's on God's calendar. It's going to happen. You say, what's the proof of that? The resurrection. Look at Verse 20 or 31, the verse continues. And of this, 
He has given what? Assurance, which means proof, to all by raising him from the dead. Well, now that's a twist, isn't it? That's a bit of a surprise because usually we are used to thinking of the resurrection as proof that Christ has the power to save. But here Paul is saying that his resurrection is proof that Christ has the power to judge. So, what's the proof that he rose from the dead? Well, we could talk about the witnesses, the 500 plus witnesses talked about in 1 Corinthians 15. We could talk about the myriad of Christians who died in the first century. They died martyred believing that this was true. Why would anyone, including his own apostles, die for something that they knew didn't happen? They saw it happen. That's why they were willing to die for it. But I believe the best evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the scripture. 1 Corinthians 15.4 was read earlier. It says this, that Jesus was buried and that he was raised on the third day. Remember that, remember that. Third day in accordance with the scriptures. In fact... Jesus in Luke 16 tells a story about a man in hell. And the man says to Abraham, please send someone back from the dead to warn my family members about hell. And Abraham says to him, listen, if they don't believe the scriptures, they're not gonna believe it if someone rises from the dead. The scriptures are greater proof and the greatest proof that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. You say, where do you see that in the Bible? Well, do you remember Abraham? There was a guy named Abraham who almost sacrificed his son, Isaac, his one and only son, and he almost sacrificed him on the very spot that 2,000 years later Jesus Christ was sacrificed on, Mount Moriah. He, he, his son, in his mind, the, the, the author of Hebrews says, in, in his mind, his son Isaac was as good as dead. Imagine taking your one and only son up a hill to sacrifice him before the Lord because the Lord had commanded him to do it. He's dead. And on what day did God spare Isaac's life? Well, according to Genesis twenty-two fourteen, the third day. The third day. When all hope was seemed to be lost, God brought life on the third day. What about Jonah? Jonah swallowed by a big fish, down in the pit, down in the grave, down in the belly of a, of a big fish. And what day did he come out of that grave when all hopes seemed to be lost? Well, according to Jonah 1.17, he came out of that fish on the third day. Well, what about Joseph's brothers? Remember Joseph's brothers who sold him into slavery? And then Joseph, later in life, he imprisoned them. And the text says in Genesis that they thought that they were going to die. But then Joseph released them. And on what day did he release them? Well, according to Genesis 42, 18, he released them on the third day. Or consider Esther. You know the story of Esther. When did God save Israel from extinction through Esther? Well, according to Esther chapter 5, verse 1, they were saved on the third day. Or think about God's glory to Israel on Mount Sinai when God revealed himself finally to humanity after withdrawing himself from this earth when man sinned in the garden, he finally came back down and revealed himself in glory in the clouds on Mount Sinai. And when did that happen? But on the third 
day, it says in Exodus 19.11. Or have you ever read Hosea chapter 6, 1 through 2? Come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us that he may heal us. He has struck us down, and he will bind us up. On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live in his presence. One final example. When did life first appear on this earth? On the third day. On the third day of creation. You go back to Genesis 1, and you see that on the third day, life rises out of the ground. And it says that there were trees and vegetation yielding seed. And what did Jesus compare his death and resurrection to? He compared it to a seed falling to the ground and dying, but then rising to newness of life. Therefore, God has given proof of the resurrection of Jesus Christ in his word, but also everywhere you look. So, how are you going to respond to this? There's one of three options. The first response is rejection. You could reject what I'm saying this morning. Look at verse 32. Now, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some people what? Mocked. And I have no doubt there is a good chance that some of you will leave this morning, you'll get in your cars, and you'll share a little chuckle. You'll reject it. The other response is acceptance. Look at verses 33 and 34. So Paul went out from their midst, but some men joined him and believed, among whom also were Dionysius the Arapagite and a woman named Damaris and others with them. And you'll notice that it doesn't just say that they believed Paul, but they joined him. Whenever you have true faith in Jesus Christ, you don't just say, well, I believe. You join. You join. You join the apostles and the church. So they joined him. That's true acceptance of the message. But what's the third and final possible response? A willingness to hear more. Maybe you're here this morning and you're like, I don't accept what you're saying, but you know what? I really don't reject it either. I'd like to learn more. Well, look at what it says in verse 32, the middle of verse 32. But others said, we will hear you again about this. So my prayer for you this morning is if that's you, we would love to have you back to hear more about this Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we come humbly before you. Those of us who do know you in this room are pleading before you for those who do not know you, for those who have adopted a lie or many lies about God, as Romans 1 says, and have exchanged the truth about God for a lie. And they have ignorant, false views of who you are. Lord, I pray that you would reveal yourself to them through your word and open their hearts to understand and believe. Crush their pride. Help them to see their need for a savior. Help them to know that you sent your son to die and to rise in order to conquer death. Their greatest fear, Lord. What's going to happen to me when I die? You have conquered death and made it possible for death to now be an instrument that ushers them into life. We praise you for that. And we ask for your mercy and your grace. Amen.